Welcome everyone to this panel on the future of work return on trust. Um, I'm joined here by Joe Herkin, who is the CEO of Issue, and Andrea Moni, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Blue Spark Hub Singapore. Uh, my name is Nicholas Johnson, and I'm the CEO of Economists Without Borders, and really look forward to having a fantastic discussion. Uh, Vivian Guo from the Jacksonville Artificial Intelligence Group may be joining later. Uh, she's been delayed. So we are emerging from the back end of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've really seen this transform the, the workplace. Um, we've seen an uptake of hybrid working, where people are working both remotely and in the office. We've seen um, a faster uptake of artificial intelligence and um, remote working technology. And we've got a lot of changes which are temporary and some which are here to stay. So um, I'd really like to hear both of your thoughts um, on this, this topic initially, and maybe you can introduce yourselves as well, about three minutes each, and then we can start an interactive round of discussions. Um, Joe, would you like to kick us off? Sure. So I'm, I'm, uh, as <clears throat> mentioned, I'm Joe Herkin. I'm the CEO of Issue. It's, um, it's great to be back at another a racist event. Um, just briefly about Issue, we're a massive digital publishing platform that enables businesses large and small from, from Costco and Patagonia to individual entrepreneurs to make their marketing materials, brochures, conference exhibitor materials, catalogs, content marketing materials, publications digitally available in a range of assets from mobile optimized social stories formats to video enhance paginated documents, and then distribute them to any channel. So we're really right in the middle of this digital transformation ecosystem where businesses and marketers are starting to really leverage and take advantage of opportunities that are available to them uh, digitally. Um, as a company, we've got three locations, Palo Alto, Copenhagen, and Berlin. And uh, lately, we've got, we have these three offices, but lately I kind of think uh, we've got about 100 people in the company uh, which means we have a hundred different offices in uh, places that they used to be called living rooms, um, and, and now people are just operating remotely from their homes. Um, but while we're only about a hundred people between creators and uh, and readers, we we reach hundreds of millions of customers and consumers every year. Um, so we've got a pretty interesting uh, perspective, both in terms of of uh, our customers and folks that are using us to leverage what's available digitally. Um, as well as what we're, how we're operating uh, as a business as well, particularly as we start thinking about this post-COVID world. Um, you know, just a, a couple of thoughts on it. I think first, uh, first and foremost is that more than ever, leadership, CEOs and, and, uh, and, and, the, and their management team, and then the extended leadership uh, needs to check in with the rest of the team more often than ever before really take the time to talk to people, phone, Slack, video calls, masked walks. Um, I, I, I can't emphasize enough taking the time um, because regardless of the automation that we may be utilizing or will utilize, at the end of the day, our companies are made up of human beings creating products and delivering services to other human beings. And uh, what, what I'm seeing, again, both at a customer level and uh employee level is that people are more stressed now than ever because of the connect the disconnection that's been brought on by COVID. Uh, they're disconnected from their colleagues that they normally would be having lunch with or talking to in, in hallways and over water coolers. Um, they're disconnected from, uh, from families and worrying about uh, how families are doing. And what I think happens is that people have this tendency to isolate when they're working remotely if they're not used to it. And that means they'll end up doing what I call cluster meeting. Um, they'll meet the same people, get limited exposure for the rest of the organization. And that means that uh, the, the normal interaction that kind of flows throughout an organization ends up being increasingly limited in, um, in this time. And, uh, and we're not benefiting from that, uh, from the dynamism that's often, often available because while remote, I think, is going to be uh, an ongoing phenomenon, um, there, those who aren't used to it haven't had the, that experience with sort of how to build that dynamic interaction uh, and that sort of off-the-cuff 
interaction that often we benefit from so much. Um, I think the other biggie is uh, mental health awareness and support is is increasingly important. Um, really being aware of how people are isolating, how people are doing. Um, it's it's more challenging, I think, for uh, for everybody because they're concerned about their their families, but they're also uh, concerned about just their own friends and uh, uh, and aren't getting the normal interaction that they have. So it's going to increasingly become an important aspect that businesses need to be aware of and thinking about. Um, I think moving forward, remote work will be increasingly accepted as standard. But I think we're also going to have in-office, in-facility, will continue to dominate for the next decade. I think more people are going to return to offices than we currently think. And uh, and I also think the notion of, of ongoing remote work is actually a luxury. Uh, for most in- industries and businesses, uh, being in the in the office in the factory is going to be the norm. Uh, store store workers, construction, factory workers, um, that this remote work is a privilege that most won't be able to uh, to experience and, and take advantage of. Um, on the on the topic of AI and robotics, these are not new topics. Um, the challenges that we deal with related to them are decades old, if not older. So we we need to stop being surprised by them. Like. They're, they're continuing. We've, we've seen automation manifest in the workplace for, for decades. Um, so as a business, it's important for us to plan additional training and human innovation as a way to stay ahead of any massive layoffs that manifests when we do get uh, surprised by these technical innovations. Uh, from a management perspective, I think it's important to just keep really talking to people about how the people in the company and AI will work together rather than AI and automation only replacing people. They'll, they'll replace some tasks, but then the people will uh, and, and humans will have additional opportunities and, uh, and areas to, uh, to focus on and reminding people and preparing people and getting them ready for that uh, uh, matters quite a bit. So uh, I think as, as we're looking at these actual plans and creating them, uh, then employees also start to be part of the plan as opposed to being surprised or uh, we at a management level just, just hoping we figure it out. Um, so those are sort of the, some of the key things I've been thinking about related to this topic and happy to dig into more with questions as we move forward. Sounds great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Andrea, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what, what do you think? Sure. Hello, everyone. It's great to be at Oresis again, although I prefer the usual format where we meet and <laughs> we get to know each other. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Andrea Moni. I'm, um, I'm a partner at uh, Blue Spark Hub. We are based in, uh, we're based in Singapore. And um, I would say we have uh, two main verticals of business. Uh, one is supporting, um, I would call them traditional Italian business setting up um, their office in their presence in uh, in Southeast Asia. So it means our clients tend to be medium to big companies. Mean, so, so companies which are, which are big enough to justify an, an office in, uh, in this region. And, um, and with them, uh, we, we help them from uh, setting up the, setting up the office, finding the, finding the first employee. And, uh, and then we grow, we grow with them. So the company is uh, is very young. We are four years old. So our oldest client in the region is four years old, more or less. I'm making long story short. So it's um, so it's very good because we are, we we are able to grow with them. So this also help us our our growth. So we don't uh, we 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 are not uh, you know dealing with a big company and uh, all the issues that uh, big companies have. So we can we can grow with them and we can leverage our experience in the region. Then we have a second second vertical which is. Uh, Right now, it's more a it's more a hobby, but maybe one day will become a, a business that is helping uh, Italian startups uh, finding um, e- either investors or partners for the growth, uh, either in the region or uh, or globally. And, uh, and this is going well. We have a few cases that are uh, that are doing well in the region, and they've found good partners. And uh, as I said, maybe one day we become we become a business. Is uh, in terms of what's happening, what, I'm, what we're seeing here from uh, the remote working perspective is interesting because it's um, Asia tend to be um, very traditional uh, 
environment for work. So it's uh, so remote working uh, was not an option until uh, I would say a year ago. Actually, it was uh, it was thrown uh, was thrown about when <laughs> when I used to say to people that uh, I work from home because I I always had uh, I was lucky I always had the option to to work from where I wanted either from home from the office or from a cafe. People were looking at me like I was. Uh, like I was, a, like I was a privilege or a tai tai, you know, as they call them, <laughs> as they call them here. So tai tai usually are are the wise or rich or rich men who don't need to work. So it's uh, so it's been very very interesting to see the to see the acceleration from uh, working from home uh, not to be an option, from um, working from home to be the new normal, as they as they call it in Singapore. So there was a there was a very very big um, it was a very very big shift in uh, in that. And uh, and it looks like it's uh, at least here is going to stay. Also because it's uh, officially the, the official guideline from the government is to work from home. So it's uh, so it's interesting to see what's happening. That it's uh, especially middle aged uh, middle aged um, middle aged employees. They are really taking advantage of taking about me. I, I say taking advantage, but it's uh, not necessarily. In, in a bad way, it's a, in a good way. So it's uh, they're not going, they're not going to the office anymore, and uh, mm, mm, and uh, as I say, it's uh, so far it looks like it's doing is doing well. Obviously, I see I see challenges challenges on this, especially in our organization. For instance, there's uh, we have one employee that I've seen her in um, since since in the, in the, since January last year. I saw her three times. <laughs> which is, uh, although she lives uh, half an hour away from where I live. And uh, so this is, uh, I would call it a paradox, but it's also, um, it's, also, um, it's also good because probably this employee would have left us because it's uh, in, in normal circumstances, her, her family situation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't allow her to work for us. So it's, uh, I would say overall, it's, um, overall this shift has been one of the, one of the good things of COVID and, uh, uh, but obviously, I see some uh, I see some challenges and some concerns that uh, that um, I mean, that we can discuss as further we go in the discussion. Fantastic. So, I guess one of the first questions I wanted to throw out there is: um, How important do you think physical proximity is um, in your workplace and in, you know in the workplaces of people you see around you? Uh, and what sort of physical proximity are we talking about? Um, is, is it closeness to other employees? Or is it closeness to uh, the customers or the client? And uh, how frequent do those interactions need to be? Uh, do you find that the interactions need to be with the same people in, in a, a concentrated working group? Or is it with lots of different people that change all the time? And is this interaction indoors, like in an office space, or is it outdoors in a, in a cafe? What sort of proximity do you see? And how has this been changed due to COVID? Um, well, I'll, I'll take a couple uh, answers to a couple of those. You know, certainly I think... It has become standard now for interaction with customers to happen digitally. Um, you know, there are meetings that would have never been considered to be possible uh, without being face to face that people are now taking over Zoom or, uh, or over some video conferencing that, um, that end up being in many cases more productive because you can get the right people into a room. You don't have to, uh, you know, you, people don't have to travel. You don't have to figure out schedules. You can do things. I think in a lot of cases, you can do things more efficiently and more quickly. Um, and and we're accepting it as a way of interacting. Um, I think um, I, I still think there are certain aspects. You know, the, the, there's this notion that we used to say, "I want to sit in the room with the person and look them in the eye and um, and confirm." You know, and and it's amazing how fast that has totally disappeared. Uh, people are totally comfortable doing this. I think this conference is a, is a great example, right? You know, Horasis only existed in person in Lisbon and, and other uh, locations. And I think, you know, Horasis probably is getting more speakers, more quality speakers than they were able to get. It's, it's easier for people to participate and share their ideas and information. So um, at, a, at a business level, certainly in our company, we 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 built a culture prior to COVID around getting to know each other. Um, you know, we all have lunch together, stop what we're doing during the day, and get to know each other a little bit, and eat together. And um, there's lots of chatter 
uh, around uh, making coffee and all those sorts of, um, of uh, activities that happen normally in the office, and you lose that. So it's not good or bad necessarily, but I think those small interactions, seemingly small interactions, often lead to some of the best ideas and creativity and spontaneous discussion around, hey, I saw this piece of data, and it might be someone that you're not normally talking to. So I think you have to make a huge effort to actually understand the value of the interactions that we had grown so accustomed to, and then identify ways to continue to have that kind of interaction. So setting up informal uh, Zoom chats with different people, doing you know Zoom lunches with people, um, making sure that you're connecting beyond the, the, the usual limited sphere of people that we interact with um, so that we can have the efficiency of, uh, of digital and remote, but the value of the interaction that, that um, I think is quite important. No, I agree. I agree with you, and that's my my main. Uh, I would call it my main concern out of this um, digitalization and virtualization of the of the of the workplace. But as I said, in uh, overall, I see it as positive, as uh, it's giving us more options, and uh, more options are always good. The the problem that um, these can lead that uh, I, I would just as we were talking, I was thinking about the right word, and I think it's the, the word that came to my mind is alienation. It can bring us to even further workplace alienation. That uh, I see it happening in uh, tend to happen in big in big organization where people they just uh, just stick to their own uh, to their own task and they don't uh, they don't look beyond it. And this can bring it um, can can bring it uh, lack of creativity, lack of uh, and lack of innovation. Because as uh, as you said, sometimes the most interesting ideas, most interesting innovation came from. Uh, from casual conversation at uh, at a coffee at a, at a water fountain or at a coffee machine where people are just discussing and then they, they say this so this data is a bit unusual what do you think yeah. and that's how that's how innovation most of the time happens as I as I'm missing for instance a lot uh, networking events where you go you meet people that uh, you wouldn't usually meet because it's people from different industries different maybe different age groups or different um, different backgrounds that is yeah. when uh, that is when i think the best ideas come from is when you pick when you talk to somebody who has different ideas from different ideas from you so i think it's uh it's necessary it's probably in, in especially as the as organization become bigger and bigger and bigger probably you need a bit of, of a more formal uh, it's a paradox <laughs> you need a formal you need to formalize informality that is um it is a, is a bit of a paradox, but I think it's necessary to keep uh, to keep an organization grow and and uh, avoid and to avoid getting um, getting sterile. I, I think that's right, but I, I also think um, you know the ways that we use to operate conferences, for instance, um, that that kind of exposure to different ways of thinking and and uh, and ideas and people and meeting people and the networking. Uh, also, I think it's a luxury. I mean, you know, only a very small percentage of people in a company would actually ever participate in that sort of thing. Um, that kind of information didn't, there wasn't an effective way to distribute it. Um, so for instance, if I went to a Horasis event, it was me going to the event. There wasn't a lot of exposure for folks at issue to the event itself. Um, now we're seeing events, uh, you know, create video, uh, content from these events much more readily and distribute it more widely. You know, Ted was always very good at distributing their talks, probably better than almost everyone else. So people, so anybody could get access to the information at Ted. Um, the exclusiveness that, that sort of permeated the, uh, the conference and the trade show world is now being more widely accessible and available. I think that's good. So I think information is more widely available. Um, now, are there the right tools in place for businesses to take advantage of that information and to work together to leverage that information in ways that go beyond our comfort zone, right? We're comfortable with sitting in a room with a whiteboard and getting 20 people around and brainstorming and talking about ideas and all that stuff. Um, get. 20 people on a Zoom and you can't see them and they turn the mic off and they 
uh, are looking at their phone while they're doing it and they're distracted and they, they're, you know, there's a whole range of things that, that they can participate in as opposed to the thing that, that you want to be focusing on. So, um, getting access to the tools matters a lot. Just want to touch on that point there. So what do, what can businesses do? What systems can they put in place to ensure that we don't have, um, Zoom fatigue, and um, how can we ensure that that transfer of, um, of of knowledge and ideas, but also um, proper functioning feedback loops that would take place in a physical office? How can we ensure that takes place um, remotely? What what can businesses do if they're really looking to improve the way they operate in a remote world? Yeah. Good, Andrea, good, yeah. good question. <laughs> I mean, uh, okay, as I, as I said, right now we have uh, we have more options, and it's uh, it's great. So it's um, so we have uh, we have more choices, and um, as I said, probably we need uh, maybe we need to set up uh, of official uh, Zoom Zoom lunches or official um, Zoom workout or or use different tools that uh, we don't we don't know them yet. It's uh, as I said, it's uh, in general, it's uh, I would say uh, having more option uh, is always good, and uh, what is important is how we how we exploit uh, how we exploit the options. So we need to find uh, we need to we need to find a way to. To engage more our our teams, a way to I always like the idea of cross post pollination. So find a way to to increase um, to increase collaboration between uh, between the teams, and uh, maybe we need to look at hybrid solutions. So maybe have a, have a, have a, one, one physical event plus uh, online follow ups or vice versa to have uh, maybe virtual 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 with virtual working groups and getting uh, real life uh, presentation so it's uh, i guess it's a uh, is a lot of um, is a lot is a, is a lot, lot of work uh, to to do and a lot of opportunities because as i said from uh, from this can come um, can come alienation uh, uh, or can come integration it's really how organization decide to they say to embrace and to and to leverage the the opportunities. Right now, I, I don't have the answer. I can I can speak for I can speak for us. We are a, we are a small team. We are a, we are five people in Singapore and one person in uh, one person in Australia and uh, two people in Italy in different cities. So it's, as I say, so we have two offices in Italy or one person. And uh, so it's uh, we also trying to find way to to and we always been fine. We always try to find ways because how we operate and uh, right now it's even it's even it's even um, it's even more challenging to try to integrate the team and the problem is that uh, in a way there are also um, is there are people that can uh, end up in um, how you say um, cocooning like isolating as uh, as we said before so this is important to to avoid that and, t- and maybe try to um, try to to find the symptoms early and avoid it in order to avoid the uh, cluster and isolation. So it's, uh, I said, it's, it's a, it's a challenge and an opportunity and we need to find, uh, we need to find ways to um, find ways to leverage. And in a way we also, we also, an important is not to be lazy because it can be also, I also saw it uh, on my, on my side. As I said, I have this, uh, this team member where I've been seeing for a year. So it's very easy to forget about her. And uh, only, 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 only remind about her when you're missing a report, or uh, or you see, or you see an email. So that's that's another way that we need to make an effort to make sure that everybody is in the loop, everybody is, is connected. And uh, and uh, again, it's uh, it's a luxury that we have, and we need to we need to find a way to to to, to include everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you mentioned COVID fatigue uh, co- or Zoom fatigue. Mm-hmm. I think Zoom fatigue and COVID f- fatigue are very real, and they are impacting businesses um, at, a, at an increasing rate. And I think we've seen in the last, just in the last couple of months, um, that e- as we're getting to the end of COVID or the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, the challenges that people are dealing with related to it seem to actually be increasing. Um, because people are really tired of it and want to move into the next phase of uh, of, of their lives. Yeah, I uh, myself, for instance, try to avoid uh, Zoom meetings as much as I can. Uh, for instance, if uh, if I'm meeting somebody, it's very funny. In Sing- no, I live in Singapore, very small, very small environment. Very often, the person I'm meeting is sitting uh, ten minutes away, literally ten minutes away from me. So I, I'm sometimes I try to. I mean, either depending how well I know the person, either politely or unpolitely, I tell them <laughs> I tell them to meet in person rather than having a Zoom meeting. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly try to do phone calls too, um, where I can walk or uh, mm. get some exercise in the middle of the day. Mm. I, I think um, there's a couple of different aspects related to all this also that we have to look at. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, remote working discussions are being driven and led by relatively big companies, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, Salesforce, on the, at least on the technology side. And they have the resources and the people in their HR departments to and, and on their tech teams to go put in place software and systems that uh, that their employees can take advantage of. Um, and I think we have to remind ourselves that, you know, it's a very small number of companies. They employ a lot of people, but it's a very small number of companies that are in the best position to take advantage of the tools that are available in a, in a remote environment. And smaller companies struggle more because we don't have a huge... HR organization or systems up, uh, organization to go set things up. So we're, we're, we're constantly learning uh, new, uh, new ways to go, um, uh, to go about working together. Um, I think the other piece is that, that I've been really excited by and, and inspired by is the resiliency and the creativity of, um, of people on the team. Again, as I mentioned, we've got a hundred people located between the U S and Europe and, um, people figuring out different tools to try and see like, can we whiteboard here? Uh, can we, uh, can we figure out how we have a social game night uh, with people and figuring out how to, you know, do charades um, with a digital whiteboard. Um, so there's a, there's a level of resiliency and creativity that, um, that we can rely on with the teams to, um, uh, and move forward. At the end of the day, I think most people really want to take and figure out how to uh, how to continue to be creative and do a great job. Uh, we need to be able to make sure they've got the tools to to do that um, as mm. much as we can. Mm. Do you think Do you think um, remote working during COVID has changed your perspective on the value of a physical office and how much you might be willing to to invest in that as a space? Um, I say this because not too long ago I had lunch with um, a friend of mine who's um, a tax partner at um, at KPMG and and he said um, that you know one of their clients just had just recently signed an 18 year lease on a huge corporate office right in the middle of the central business district and as a result of this they were you know encouraging the employees to well actually enforcing a rule that the employees had to be back in the office um, a couple of days a week at least. So has, has that changed your perspective on the value of that? Well, it's, you know, it's funny, like uh, Dropbox signed a massive lease um, and moved in just before COVID and got out of that lease and distributed everybody. Um, I think they may have even paid people to uh, move out of the Bay Area and um, find other places. So they're like, they've totally transformed their business into being one that's remote. Uh, Pinterest had, had uh, secured this massive amount of space in downtown San Francisco and uh, paid a, a, a huge amount of money to actually get out of the lease, and they're not they're not doing that. So, I think um, there is definitely a. I think I think we're not sure about what's going to happen to to office spaces. I I believe that when this is all over, more people than not are going to want to be back in an office uh, because they like the interaction. I think we are recognizing the value of our humanness in, in the midst of this COVID stuff. And at the same time, we will allow, culturally allow a lot more flexibility than we've ever done before. And so while offices have been, you know, creating beautiful office spaces and free lunches and all the different things that often go with an office space, they've been a, a central part of the culture I think they will be a part of a culture and a part of a company, but they won't be limiting. Offices have been very limiting. Like we want to hire people in a particular location who can get into an office. And that's, that's meant uh, businesses don't have the ability to hire from, uh, from remote locations where there might be really talented, strong, capable people for, uh, for a particular job. So I think we're going to have both. And I, but I do think there's going to be, 
more people wanting to go back into the office than uh, than we're expecting right now. Yeah, there's definitely going to be um, a change in the um, in the physical structure of the office, and uh, and but again, this is not something new. It's something that probably COVID has accelerated. So it's uh, and this has been leading by the companies in the Bay Area. I remember, I remember like twenty twenty years ago. Some If, uh, if, uh, if I need to write emails, I don't need to be in the office. If I need to write emails, I can be home. If I need to, if I need to discuss a business issue or, uh, or, plan, uh, or plan a new project, I need, to be, I need to be somewhere where I can discuss and I can be, I can be comfortable and, I can be, and, and, and my creativity can, uh, can grow. So this is definitely going to be a change how offices are made. And uh, this can probably lead to cost efficiencies because uh, I'm not going to need an office where I can fit a, a thousand people all the time. Maybe I need an office where I can fit 250, 250 people comfortably. So this is definitely a big, a big change. And I remember something that I about a year, about two years ago, I went to a, to an event at the Ageo office in Singapore, and it was interesting because they 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 used to rent a floor in a the building, then uh, then they 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 left half of it. So and uh, the, the the remaining half they kept, they transformed it into into a bar. So the office of the Ageo in Singapore was a bar. So people, when they went to the office, they went to a bar. So until uh, until 5 p.m., they didn't serve alcohol. After 5 p.m., they served alcohol. But uh, the, the office literally was was a bar, which was great because if you had to if you had to meet a client, you can meet him in, in your office where you could, we were showcasing your products. So what better way to to engage a client in a place where they can see your products? So there's definitely a big shift in the in the office in the office environment, and this has been. Uh, and again, this is probably good because it's going to force companies which uh, which maybe are smaller or less progressive to, um, to to invest also in the workplace in order to you know to retain and attract talent. Yeah, I think we'll use the space differently. Whether it's it's a bar um, in an office exactly. or or um, you know people won't have their own particular space. We we've already seen this evolve a lot, right? Um, you know, in the last twenty years, we've gone from everybody having their own cubicle and offices to uh, open open floor uh, plans. Um, and we'll, we'll see, you know, continuing evolutions of how we leverage that space. How do you use that space to really interact with customers in ways that you haven't before? Um, how do you showcase your own products in ways that you haven't before? How do you, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, Effort that's gone into is uh, as we were talking about earlier. Like, you know, people would talk about how beautiful the office is. Is the like I want to go to this place. I want to go to Google because they have a great office, or you know, Google has all these different cafeterias, and I want to try each one. And um, you know, it, the the office the office sometimes becomes a distraction um, as opposed to uh, existing for the purpose of. Uh, Executing and building the business and, and connecting together uh, as people. Exactly. No, that's, that's what I meant. If uh, if you need to write emails or prepare a report, probably it's better to be home because nobody's going to nobody's going to see the star me. You're lucky. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that the that the the home environment again, it's a luxury. I mean, I think there's plenty of people who have. Uh, you know, they have two. Their, their homes are too tiny to actually be able to work from, um, depending on where you are in the world. Or they have family members who actually are a big distraction. Um, mm-hmm. We've seen a lot of people having to manage working full time while also having to, you know, teach Zoom first graders or second graders uh, full time during the course of this pandemic. So, mm-hmm. um, again, I think I think sometimes. Being working from home is, makes a lot of sense, uh, where you don't have the distractions. Also, it can be um, it can be distracting, and and, and no, sure, no, mine, no, mine, no, mine was an example, meaning that if I if I need to work if I need to work the places on, on sometimes when I want to work, I want to work in an environment where I can focus. So it's uh, if I can yeah. focus at home, it's it's great. If I can focus in the office, it's uh, it's great too. But as long as I have a place to to focus on. Yeah. Um, sort of touch on trust as well. So, uh, 
do you think that um, well, you, you as employers and you know other employers that you know around you, do you think that they that, you, that, you, that you're able to trust employees to do work um, properly and efficiently in a remote environment? And and how do you how do you maintain and, and build that trust? Well, this is a very interesting question and an interesting issue that I I faced uh, as soon as I as soon as I came to as I moved to Asia from uh, to Singapore. I've been in Singapore since 2004, and before that I um, I work in in, in Italy in the US. So again, I, I I've been uh, I don't know whether lucky or just uh, it just happened that I I always been working in professional in professional services. So it was an environment where uh, trust. Uh, Trust was high, let's say, or uh, or trust was uh, was assumed, meaning that uh, if I had to do a if I had to do a, jo- a job, I was supposed to do it. Doesn't matter where I did it, as long as I as long as I did it. So when I when I came to to Singapore, I, I noticed that uh, it was a very very different environment. Uh, I would say it was a low trust environment or or very traditional, call it as, as you want. But the result was it was a very strict, uh, uh, very strict working hours. Uh, there was a lot of face time was expected. People were supposed to be in the office, were supposed to, to show themselves to the boss and show that they were working long hours, even if they were not uh, achieving much. So it's, uh, and I didn't see a big change in uh, in this in the past 20 years. I mean, it's, uh, and um, and then again, COVID accelerated it. So in a way it was, um, again, whether it was something organic or something, uh, or something forced, uh, it's been, uh, uh, it's been a good thing because it's as, uh, as forced companies and uh, and employers to 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 trust the employees whether it's uh, whether they do it in a in good faith or uh, in necessity they have to do it and uh, and this is a and this is a good thing because again it's giving uh, it's giving options and uh, and more opportunities. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think people have uh, their work to do and you do it, and uh, they can be. They can, they can do a great job in an office. They can do a great job remotely. They can do a bad job in an office. They can do a bad job remotely. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, I, I don't think that changes at all. Um, I think if anything, it gives people the flexibility, and that flexibility itself breeds even more trust. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's not that I – don't, I don't really think there's that much of a difference. Um, you either – you know, there's plenty of, of people who have not been trustworthy sitting right in an office. Uh, um, I think I mean, it's mm-hmm. a it's a you know it, it's sort of a, a misconception that uh, trustworthiness and sitting in an office go hand in hand. Um, I think mm-hmm. the the work ethic and the trustworthiness of the human goes hand in hand with um, with what they're delivering. Um, or vice versa. Where sure, are they? So, no, exactly. So then the people I I remember hearing people say, "I oh, know I don't want my employees to work uh, from home because I don't I don't know whether they are working or not." And I said, "I for me, I only I, if I need, if I need to worry about whether somebody is working or not, I don't I don't want him as an employee. I don't want him as a team as a team member. I want to have team members who I can trust and I can I know they're going to deliver. And if they, if they're not able to deliver, I want I want them to tell me so I can help them." Hmm. Uh, Nicholas, uh, she- Shelley actually had a comment in the comment section. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, I didn't see it. Has a question a there. So how can we ensure that salespeople don't feel the need to visit with customers all the time to win the deal? <laughs> uh, yes. I, well, actually, this is pretty interesting because, um, you know, I was chatting to um, a few business people um, earlier this week. In, in Brisbane, and you know, prior to COVID, um, they would do you know three flights a day to Sydney and Melbourne. It's, you know, it's about an hour, hour and a half away, um, just 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 for meetings. That was the the, the way they do things. And now that everything's on on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or the like, and um, and and they're saying that you know, as soon as they're able to, they're going to go back into the flights because they reckon that you know you can do as many Zoom meetings as you want, but Eventually, someone's going to realise they can turn up in front of the person, and and, and they'll, they'll get the deal. That was the perception, anyway. So, um, how can we, yeah, how can how can how can we deal with this? Um, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges that companies had as as we were getting into 
operating in this new remote COVID world. Businesses that relied on in-person sales calls to close deals suffered the most because they had to retrain a sales organization to be able to handle things uh, digitally. And again, I think there, there will, there's never a replacement for genuine, real human interaction, but we could start to have them now um, over, over Zoom or with a telephone call. And I think after Zoom, you will still have in-person meetings. You'll go, you'll go make those in-person calls, but you'll be able to set a lot, a lot more up over phone or over Zoom. And because this has gone on for so long in most parts of the world, this has gone on for a year and, and will go on for, for longer. Um, we have learned how to close deals in the last year without being in person. And so I think what the, the best thing to do is to remind your salespeople, look at what you've actually done in the last year. We've, we've made a radical shift. Uh, you know, typical ways that we uh, are taught to close deals in a, in a sales process. Um, I, I think we can be a lot more efficient. Now, the challenge is that customers who aren't going to do a deal uh, can be harder to get a hold of. Um, and so it's incumbent upon the salesperson to do their research, get their phone number, know their email, understand, you know, when they're working in the office. There's like, a, there's, a, there's going to be a layer of, interaction and preparedness that you're going to have to do with the people that you're trying to sell to in terms of getting their information and then not being afraid to use it, uh, that, that ends up being pretty different. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. And then it's, um, again, it's, um, in Asia is a bit of, a, um, again, it's a bit of a different perspective because it's, uh, Asia, it's, uh, what they call high touch environment. So it's, uh, so clients are expecting to see the, to see the salesperson. And, uh, and, and a bit of vice versa, a salesperson expecting to see the client. So you, um, so, and until, uh, until a year ago, you could see a bit of, uh, sometimes exaggeration, as, uh, as Nicola said, people taking three planes in a day or people spending, uh, maybe 200, uh, 250 days on the road, uh, meet, meeting clients. So this is, uh, actually, it's, uh, I think is a, is a good way that, uh, show us how we can, uh, we don't need to travel so much. And uh, and probably before there was a bit of abuse of that. So this is mm -hmm. probably will will lead to to better efficiency and better um, mm -hmm. and better use of uh, better use of resources, whether they are company resources or uh, environmental resources. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this um this panel is due to close in a couple of minutes. So yeah, of do both of you want to sum up um, the discussion in a minute each? Maybe just mention one thing that businesses can do to can do immediately to improve the way they they work in the current environment. Well, I think it is important to avoid uh, isolation of, um, of of teams and try to find ways to um, to um, to encourage uh, cross collaboration and uh, and pollination. I would say you know each month find one new software product that you can use for efficiency. Try Miro. Try different tools that are out there. There's a lot of new tools coming online very quickly. And just try one. Try one every month. If you can, try one every week, and then you'll see what works for your organization. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks for joining the panel, and it's been a pleasure to, to chat with you all about um, the future of work. And um, I can't wait to reconnect at a future harasses. Sure. Thank yeah, you so much. Bye. Thank you so much.